Dear students and audience, this is the third video of the first chapter uh, of the novel God of Small Things by Ed Umduti Roy. This chapter is very long, so that is why for the benefit of students, I am dividing it into various parts. Third part video of this chapter contains three characters mainly. One is Amu and second one is Esther and the third one is Rahel. Their stories will be introduced in detail, a lot of light will be thrown on them. However, it is not the matter that the stories will end here, they will continue, but a lot of significant light is thrown on the stories of these three characters. So let us, let us start with the story of Amu first of all, as the yellow uh, colored lines are indicating. Let's have some reading first of all, so that we can set a tone. After the funeral, Amu took the twins back to Kotiam police station. They were familiar with the place they had spent a good part of the previous day there. Anticipating sharp, smoky stink of old urine that permeated the walls and furniture. They clamped their nostrils shut well before the smell began. Amu asked for the station house officer and when she was shown into his office, she told him that there had been a terrible mistake and that she wanted to make a statement. She asked to see Valyutha. Inspector Thomas Matthew Mustaches bustled like the friendly Air India Maharajas, but his eyes were sly and greedy. It's a little too late for all this, don't you think, he said. He spoke the coarse Gautiam dialect of Malayalam. He stared at Amu's breast as he spoke. He said the police knew all they needed to know and that the Gautiam police didn't take statements from Vashyas or their illegitimate children. Amu said she she would see about that. Inspector Thomas Matthew came around his desk and approached Amu with his baton. If I were you, he said, I would go home quietly. Then he tapped her breast with his baton, gently tap tap as though he was choosing mangoes from a basket, pointing out the ones that he wanted packed and delivered. Inspector Thomas Matthew seemed to know whom he could pick on and whom he couldn't. Policemen have their instinct behind him. A red and blue board said, well, before going to what the board said, let us take uh, one by one the things which are said in this uh, highlighted passage. First of all, some places have been indicated that Kothiam police station in Malayalam, so that is the kind of place where the story is going on. And the police station is being described in different kind of smells and smokes like it is sharp smoky stink which was coming of urine from there and the children had to shut there so it was the kind of dirty place the kind of place where there was no care taken about the smells of urine but that was the thing it was happening in the police station so police station is such a dirty place according to arundhati uh, roy which is being described here and then comes the officer and the uh, and amu who meet each other in the in the same police station there uh, the mind of that police station uh, officer is again uh, very much dirty and smelly and smoky and stinky uh, in the same way as the whole building that is, can be that can be there we also get the information that amu had gone in order to see velutha it means that velutha was inside the jail while the beginning of the chapter does not tell us anything like that it goes to show that something wrong has happened and that wrong thing is being kept uh, you know in, in hidden, in dark, that's not being shown to us, but something bad has happened and the story will continue and we will try to find out what is that bad thing. Uh, the inspector name is Thomas Matthew. He is a traditional police station officer. I mean, he's got the big mustache and the big belly and, and ultimately talks in a coarse way, knows his power and authority and exercises this power in order to satisfy his greed. So, uh, the same inspector, uh, instead of listening to Amu, when Amu says that she has come to record a statement of hers about Valyutha, at that time the inspector comes forward and says that she should go home. And he looks at her body with, the, with a very greedy eye and, and according to him she was a body, she was not a kind of person so he rejects her altogether and asks her to go home and not only this he blames and accuses of her being a Vashya and also telling that her children were illegitimate children. Vashyas is the word used for prostitutes, uh, probably in that part of India, or it may be a word used for such women 
who has illicit relationship with any person. So in this way, she is accused of being an unacceptable woman, a woman who is not fit according to the social norms of India. She is rather a person who can be blamed because she doesn't have the support of a man, a legitimate relationship with the man. So that is why she is declared Vashi also. She is declared having illegitimate children as well. So after some time, they leave the police station and there is no success at all. And the irony comes at that time when the writer says that, look at the way the policeman deals with Amu and look at the kind of uh, writing about the police people as it is said that they have politeness, obedience, loyalty, intelligence, courtesy and efficiency. All these words which are used in police, P-O-L-I-C-E is explained in that way. But how in contrast is the behavior of the policeman to whom a woman had gone in order to meet and what kind of treatment she has received. There's a lot of feminism here, a lot of satire here, a lot of irony here. And in that way, we come to know what has happened and what is the problem with Amuno and how she will be treated by the people of India and how she, how her children will be treated in that way. So all misery will be definitely there when she is living a life like that. So this is what has happened actually in the novel. Let us go forward and discover certain more things. Uh, like uh, here, we start with the story of uh, Estha as well, that what type of child he had grown into. For example, let's make a reading. It says, two weeks later, Estha was returned. Amu was made to send him back to their father, who had by then resigned his lonely tea estate job in Assam and moved to Calcutta to work for a company that made carbon black. He had married stopped drinking and suffered only occasional relapses as then Rahit hadn't seen each other since. So in that way, uh, we, go, we go back to the place where from the story had begun that as and Rahil had come with their mom into Eminem house after the breakage which occurred into the relationship of uh, Amu and her husband. Uh, we will be later on told how this breakage occurred but whatever the case was, Amu and Estha uh, came with Rahil into that Eminem house. Uh, but later on, Estha had to be returned. After the death of Sophie Mole, Estha was returned. And the information is that, that Amu's uh, ex-husband had married and he had uh, also changed the place from Assam to you know, another place of Calcutta where he was doing a job for some time mm -hmm. and had also left drinking, which had become the real reason of uh, the divorce between Amu and that man. One more sentence which is here before the page ends. And now 23 years later, their father had re returned Estha. So Estha is the person who goes and comes and comes and goes. Because first of all, he comes with Amu into a minimum house. Then Amu packs him back into the house of uh, his father. And after that, the father again sends him back to Eminem house. So this is the child who is a type of child who is being unclaimed by everybody. That is the mom only to whom he returns again and again. Such a child definitely should have a special psychology and that's what psychology we are going to study about this child. Uh, Kochu Maria, another name has been highlighted. Kochu Maria is the woman who is working at the house of these Eminem people and she's the maid servant and she's working all the time there for a very long time rather and in that way the name should be remembered by the students for the sake of any type of objectives Kochu Maria and then comes another highlighted paragraph Esther had always been a quiet child so no one could pinpoint with a degree of accuracy exactly when he had stopped talking stopped uh, talking altogether that is the fact that there was an and exactly when it had been a gradual winding down and closing shop a barely noticeable quietening as though he had simply run out of conversation and had nothing left to say yet Esther's silence was never awkward never intrusive never noisy it wasn't accusing protesting silence as much as sort of estivation or dormancy the psychological equivalent of what a lungish uh, sorry lungfish do to get themselves through the dry season except that in Esther's case the dry season looked as though it would last forever uh, uh, last line of the passage should also be accompanied with that Esther occupied very little space in the world so in this way the psychology of Esther is being explained that he was the child who had become silent at certain part of his life and two things were very unclear that when did he become silent and why did he become silent whatever the reason may be the child had become silent he was not speaking at all he wouldn't talk to anybody he became totally silent without saying a word he was living his life so that is the characteristic of this child Esther that he's no more speaking at all he's keeping 
quite most of the time. It means that something had happened with him because of which the voice was snatched and so he was keeping all the time, you know, as silent as possible. Some more details follow here. Let us follow these. What are the details? Second part of this uh, highlighted paragraph begins with Esther finished school. Esther finished school with mediocre result but refused to go to college. Instead, much to the initial embarrassment of his father and stepmother, he began to do housework as though in his own way he was trying to earn his keep. He didn't sweeping, swabbing and the laundry. He uh, learned found out that uh, Esther was a quiet child, she didn't speak at all. And some more details are going to be added to his character. For example, if you look at the line which has been highlighted on the top of the page it says esther occupied very little space in the world it means that esther had become into a child who was not having any influence any impact or any effect on the life of the people around him he was such a silent such a reticent such a person who was not having a particular influence on anyone and so is the next highlighted passage uh, ignore the first part which begins with after Sophie Moore's funeral, go to the second part of the highlighted passages, Esther finished. Let's start from here, reading it. Esther finished schools with mediocre results, but refused to go to college. Instead of much to the initial embarrassment of his father and stepmother, he began to do the housework as though in his own way. He was trying to earn his keep. He did the sweeping, swabbing, and all the laundry. He learned to cook and shop for vegetables, vendors in the bazaars, sitting behind pyramids of oil, shining vegetables, grew to recognize him and would attend to him amidst the clamoring of their other customers. They gave him rusted film cans in which to put the vegetables he picked. He never bargained. They never created, they never cheated him. When the vegetables had been weighed and paid for, they would transfer them to his red plastic shopping baskets, onions at the bottom, uh, brinjals and tomatoes on the top, and always a spring of coriander and a fistful of green chilies for free. As they carried them home in the cur crowded tram, a quiet bubble floating on the sea of noise, or at meantime, when he wanted something, he got up and helped himself. So these passages about Esther's life go to indicate once again one of the examples of his being silent and one of the examples how he became more and more insignificant. For example, Esther couldn't continue his studies very well as the passage indicates. He was unable to join the college and instead he started to work at home. He started to work at home like a servant, I mean sweeping, swabbing and laundry and after that making uh, groceries shopping, vegetable shopping in the market and all the time he was able to shop without speaking and he brought there. The writer compares this person with a quiet bubble floating on a sea of noise. I mean the world is known for its noises. Everyone is speaking, making the noise, but Esther was somebody who was keeping quiet at all, was not speaking even a single word at all. So in that way, he was the one who would stand up and do the things for himself instead of asking, raising voice. I mean he had become a voiceless person. The person who doesn't have a voice, possibly, according to Roy, does not have any value as a human being in this world. So voice is the most important thing that it should come. So in this way, uh, Roy's novel, The God of Small Things, can also be talked with reference to the caste system. In certain caste, voice was necessary, and in other caste system, the voice was not necessary. So the people who spoke, they mattered, and the people who didn't speak at all, they didn't matter at all. So in that way, Esther was one of those people. Even after being a person uh, that he belonged to the higher class, he was not a parawan. I mean, the person who is untouchable, he's, <coughs> he's not at all. But still, he didn't have the voice. So it means that uh, this voice lessness can happen at any other class level. It's not possible simply to have the voicelessness among the untouchables. It could be anywhere. So Esther's example goes to prove the claim of the writer as well. Let's go more down and see what we can have about uh, Esther. Esther was a very loving child as we are finding in this highlighted passage. 
that Kochuband was a person, it was uh, very much taken care of by, uh, by Estha. And, and so he uh, proved by taking care of this person till the time of his death, he proved that he was a very loving kind of person and that thing he proved through this uh, care of this Kochuband. And here comes another, you know, aspect of the novel that should be called political aspect of the novel. Look at the, uh, the highlighted text. Uh, sometimes as the walk past Lucky Press, old comrade can imply printing press, once the eminent office of the Communist Party, where midnight study meetings were held and pamphlets with rousing lyrics of Marxist Party songs were printed and distributed. The flag that fluttered on the roof had grown limp and old. The red had bled away. So it, this is the way how uh, the, the writer, Arun uh, Roy, introduces the political element and her liking and her uh, looking at and discussing the element of communism in Kerala state. So Kianam Pelai, another character which represents the communist party, which represents the communism in India or Marxism in India, uh, that is the person uh, representing the whole thing, Kianam Pelai. Now Kianam Pelai was a person who was seen and met by Estha again and again. He would, Estha would walk there and Pillai would notice him and both of them first didn't talk but later on they were able to indicate to each other who they were. So in this way political element of the age has also been brought by, uh, by the writer. So this is the uh, place where we can see that the story, some part of the story will be about the comrades, about the communism or about Marxism as well. So the same nature is revealed in this passage. For example, Comrade Pillai would slap himself all over to get his circulation going. He couldn't tell whether Esther recognized him after all these years or not. Not that he particularly cared, though his part in the whole thing had by no means been small one. Comrade Pillai didn't hold himself in any way personally responsible for what had happened. He dismissed the whole business as the inevitable consequence of necessary politics. The old omelette and eggs thing. But then, Comrade Kiran Pillai was essentially a political man, a professional omeletter. He walked through the world like a chameleon, never revealing himself, never appearing not to, emerging through a chaos or unscathed. So the real world of politics is being assumed, being shown to us that politics is such a system where people can change their faithfulness to any person from one person to the other. And very beautifully, the writer has compared the whole politics with the omelette and eggs thing. I mean, omeletting is the kind of thing where we uh, where we mix up many things into the egg and we smash it and after that we cook it as well. So it no more remains purely egg or it becomes a different type of egg. Same as the case with the uh, faithfulness uh, or the loyalty of uh, Ken and Pillai with the Communist Party with the passage of time was also changing and was uh, having better relationship with the non-communist people as well. So in this way, uh, the, the game of politics is also being indicated along with the understanding about one political element that Marxism did exist there and K. N. M. Pillai is one of the representative of this Marxism in India. So in that way, the story continues and ultimately reaches to baby Kuchama and that we shall be following in our next coming lecture. So thank you very much for watching. It was all for the third video on the same chapter. One more video will take place possibly and then the chapter would end. However, in today's chapter, many interesting things have come forward. One is the story of Estha and other is the story of Amu. And in that way, uh, the story of Kenam Pillai also begins there. So this part is more significant. It should be watched very carefully in order to get a good glimpse of her Dirty Joy's novel, The God of Small Things. Thank you. That's it. Hope to see you in some next video.